morning. I just ran here, so if I sound a little, I'm fine. <laughs> Alrighty, I hope you all are having an enjoyable national fan, or VANFR. It's my first time here, so I'm used to doing the introduction somewhere else. <laughs> Well, I hope you're all excited to start singing. I'm looking forward to this day. Yesterday, I was blessed by all the messages and all the activities and the fellowship with everybody. Despite the chaos our world is in, we can come together and really have an enjoyable and blessed time with each other. So I would invite you all to turn to your notebooks. I believe it's page 11. Come down, fount of every blessing. Let's sing with enthusiasm. around us and the influences and that we can stand like we heard yesterday of Daniel and his friends in different situations. So with that in mind, I invite us to turn to number 52 in our booklets, O oh Brother Be Faithful. I'm not sure if the number is in the hymn.
sing our theme song, The Light Within Our Hearts. How did everybody want to sleep? How did you sleep tonight, last night? Was it good? Good, restful to start a new day here. We want to welcome, if, who came in last night? Raise your hand if you drove in last night. I think one family, welcome. <laughs> so we want, and Angie, of course. Okay. Um. We just want to encourage you to continue to wear your mask while you enter into the gym. Uh, and that's something that uh, Restoration International of, uh, or uh, BFR want to you to do. It's just pretty much uh, the requirement from the, from the park. And they require us to wear the mask when we go to those uh, facilities. Uh, we want to just remind the resource table is, will be open today from 3 to 5 but it will close on sundown. So if you want to purchase your shirts or anything, please do before sundown, or you would have to wait until Saturday evening after sundown. 
and also make sure you wear your uh, name tag so we can be able to uh, to know each other better and to know other families. So, uh, but you have your name name tag. Just make sure you wear it. Parents, again, we want to remind um, the reverence in here, and also we would like to ask that we maintain all wheels scooters, bicycles, and things like that outside. Save it for the outside. We want to make sure everybody's safe and we don't bump accidentally into other people. So please let's keep all wheels outside. Okay, and for those that are probably camping or they need some um, ice, their eyes behind uh, next to the cap well, behind the cafeteria, there's a door to your right. Once you enter, there's, um, there's an ice machine, there's some bags you just put it up those bag with ice and you could take that for uh, your coolers. Just remind also that if you want some counseling and you would like to speak with the waters privately and also with Pastor Blake and Chris, um, you can make an appointment with them. Uh, is that booked? Do we still have space for that? You're booked? Okay. Okay. And uh, don't forget to write your question for the uh, uh, marriage uh, breakout and also for the uh, family uh, panel that we're going to have uh, tomorrow afternoon. And this is something that is not in your um, schedule there, but on Sunday morning we do have time. We're going to have a short um, program and we have testimonies um, time for that. So we want to encourage whoever will be staying to Sunday morning to participate in that. And, just see us if you want, you have a special testimony that you would like to share, okay? Okay, so our, uh, this morning our special music will be done by the uh, Workman family. Our prayer will be by Matthew Ionico. And our message uh, of family discipleship will be by Blake and Good morning, everyone. So there's going to be two special musics today. We are not the um, Wartman family, but I'm excited for when they're going to play. Um, my, um, I'm Jennifer. This is my best friend, Shastina. And we have loved being here. Shastina and I, this is our first time ever being at a Restoration International Family Camp, and it's been super awesome. We've loved it. Um, we've heard about, a lot about it from, we both went to an amazing school called Washington Hills College. And um, while we were there, we absolutely loved that environment because it's so nurturing, it grew us so much. We learned so much, so much about Christ when we were there. But we both experienced the same thing when we left Washington Hills College. We are done there. And we realized that outside of that world, it's a lot harder to live the life that you lived inside of that world. Does that make sense? When you're here at Restoration International, it's a lot easier to live this culture of God's word than when you go back home, right? And so this scripture song that we're going to sing for you guys today is a song that is something for all of us to think about right now, but especially when we go home. It's a song that David sang, saying, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. This is a prayer that we can pray when we go back home, when it's harder to live this culture of God's word.
Test, test. All right. I wasn't sure. I almost imagined that it was working a little bit. Um, so, yeah, good morning. It is, it's been such a blessing to be here. Um, and, uh, yes, we are the Workman family. Uh, my name is Isaac, my wife, Sandy, uh, my daughter, Abigail, and uh, Caleb. So, um, Sandy plays violin as well, but uh, she's going to be helping by holding a mic here this morning. So, we don't have any mic stands, so we're going to work together on this one. Um, you know, uh, in a world where anything goes, and to each his own, um, it's kind of challenging, I think, to think of one particular culture that counts, right? I think the question that's going to come to mind, maybe to our minds a little bit, and, and um, also to anybody that's, uh, you know, less studied, is going to be like, to each his own, right? Like, why is that so much better? And um, I think, well, the theme song says it very clearly, but um, this is the culture that doesn't change and lasts forever. So the one uh, song that we're going to be playing here this morning for you is Give Me the Bible. Amen.
pray to our loving Father in heaven. Dear Heavenly Father, come before you this morning thankful to be here. We've all been blessed tremendously so far. Lord, help us not to be selfish with that blessing, but to take it home with us and to share it with everyone we meet. Thank you for caring so much about us in such a detailed way and how you want to be part of our lives to bring us up into a holy and pure atmosphere where the rich current of your love can fill our hearts, fill our relationships with our wives, husbands, our children, our friends, our churches, the whole world, Lord. We need this love. This world lacks love. We lack love in our homes and churches, Lord. This is the power that can overcome the evil one. So I pray that you'd help us to be more receptive to this love, to look for it when we study your word, because you are love, and you don't run out of it, and I'm thankful for that, because I sure do need a lot of it. So I pray that your Holy Spirit would be here in this meeting now, as well as your angels, push back all the evil forces, speak to our hearts. This we ask all in Jesus' name, amen. My heart is so filled with the music that we had experienced here. Amen. Not only today, but yesterday I told, I don't know the name, so I'm sorry. I told the girl that sang yesterday, when she started singing, my eyes right away filled with, it's almost like you're hearing angels singing. And thank you, um, the Cleveland family, where are they at? Yes, thank you for your song and for your words. Uh, it is very true that we come here and we feel so close to God, close to each other as a family, and then we go out. And that's when things get a little challenging. And thank you so much for the violins. It's, it's, music speaks to me in a great way, and I am very blessed. I've been very blessed, and I'm sure all of you have been too. So today we're going to talk about discipling as a family. And we're going to share with you some principles that we have uh, adopted in our family. Yeah, that we've discovered in our journey, as I mentioned before. You know, we're all on a journey. We haven't arrived at this uh, place. I don't think any of us can ever say we have arrived at where we want to be. Because that means we're not striving, right, to go grow closer to Christ. And so we're just a family that has, uh, like, like you out here, we're living in this world and we're seeking to integrate the principles that we find in this book here uh, in our own personal lives and also in our corporate lives as a family. And so we'll be talking about family discipleship this morning. And so I want to invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah. So I, I was thinking this, I had a different introduction actually planned, but this morning in my devotional time, I, my, my mind came to this passage and I started studying this and I said, this is powerful and this is what we are all looking for. So let's go to Jeremiah chapter 35. Now, the book of Jeremiah, it's actually one of my favorite Old Testament books. It has a lot of narrative in it. It's a, it's a really epic story of a nation that is falling apart, a nation that has just morally collapsed, and God's judgment is coming upon them through this, this foreign power, through the Babylonians. So the context here is very similar to our context today. Now, we're not being invaded by a foreign army, no. But we are seeking to live out God's word and his culture 
in a world that is increasingly becoming more hostile to that and just so diametrically opposed to that. And that's what we see happening in the Old Testament where the nation of Judah just kept sliding further and further and further away from God to the point to where God says, I now have to chastise this whole nation significantly and it's through the conquest of the Babylonians. And while that is going on, and so the Babylonians are besieging the city of Jerusalem, God speaks to Jeremiah, and he highlights a certain family to, to Jeremiah, and this is what happens. It's pretty interesting. So we're in Jeremiah chapter 35. I'll start in verse 1. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Go to the house of the Rechabites, speak to them, and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers, and give them wine to drink. That's kind of a strange uh, uh, request, isn't it? Where God says, I want you to go to this family, I want you to bring them in, and I want you to serve uh, some wine to them. So this family comes in, and uh, I'll pick it up here in verse 5. We'll see what their reaction is, okay? Verse 5 says, Then I set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites, bowls full of wine and cups. And I said to them, drink wine. Now notice their response, verse six. But they said, we will drink no wine for, <clears throat> for Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father commanded us saying, you shall drink no wine, you nor your sons forever. You shall not build a house, sow seed, plant a vineyard, nor have any of these but all your days you shall dwell in tents, that you may live many days in the land where you are sojourners. Thus we have obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he charged us to drink no wine all our days, we, our wives, our sons, or our daughters, nor to build ourselves houses to dwell in, nor do we have vineyard, field, or seed, but we have dwelt in tents, and have obeyed and done according to all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. But, in the, it, but it came to pass, when this is them still talking to Jeremiah. They're explaining why they're not drinking the wine. Verse 11, he says, But it came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up into the land that we said, Come, let us go to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans and for fear of the army of the Syrians. So we dwell at Jerusalem. So they're saying, we're not really city people. We're country people. And this is how it was established for us long ago when our patriarch told us, you know, don't drink wine. Now, why would he want them building and living in, in, in a, you know, cities, right? Or living in, 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 in permanent structures. They were to live in tents. They were to be more nomadic. So I'm, I'm reflecting on this this morning and thanking this and thinking, you know, I imagine there were changes happening in the culture. Because when we read earlier in the Old Testament, they are... Um, you know, they're living in tents, like Abraham and them, they're living in tents and so on, but then cities are being built. And, and I imagine someone came along and said, the, the, this, this father, this, this Rachel, this father of the, this, this clan, said, no, we're not going to go this route. We're, we're not going to just, just, just start to build up in these cities and live here and so on. We're going to stay in tents. And guys, I don't want you drinking any wine either. Don't, don't do those things. And it's interesting that this family, if you, if you count here through the genealogy, it actually shows five generations here. And it's probably more because they often skip uh, names in these generations. But it goes back, and, and so there's five generations listed here. So this patriarch that established this family culture in a culture that was sinking, it goes on at least five generations. Now think of this. We expect Jesus to come sooner than five generations, don't we? Amen? We are hoping and longing for that day, but let's remember, God is very merciful. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So when people think it's happening like right now, I still think to myself, I think God is very merciful, and he's still waiting on more people to come to him and to repent. That's why he hasn't come yet. And so God's mercy is great. And so we may be waiting a little while longer than we think, or we may be, maybe we won't. We don't know. We know the time is near, but we don't know how many generations will pass. But I want my children to follow Christ. Don't you want that for your children? Amen? That's why you're here. But I don't just want my children to follow Christ. I want my children's children and their children's children to follow Christ. That is a very sound 
foundation of godliness when this respect for God and his word is carried out multiple generations down the line. And we'll notice how, uh, how, how God then, uh, what he says to Jeremiah about this, this family here. It says here, did I write this verse down? I believe it's, yes, yeah, verse 18. It says, and Jeremiah said to the house of the Rechabites, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because you have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab, your father, and kept all his precepts and done according to all that he commanded you. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not lack a man to stand before me forever. Amen. What a legacy. Isn't that amazing? He says, because this family has been faithful to me, not, not just one generation, but multiple generations of faithfulness. God says, I'm going to make sure that this is established forever. So there are still descendants of this family here that are serving God today. All 2,500 years later. Isn't this amazing? Brothers and sisters, this can be us as well. And I want to challenge the young people that are here. It's great that your parents are bringing you to places like this. But I want you to think much deeper than just kind of what you see right now in the here and now. And saying, by God's grace, I can have a family and have children who then have children and so on. And we can just continue this legacy on down the line until Jesus comes. Amen? Amen. So how do we do that? How do, how do we really practically put that into practice uh, today? That's what we want to talk about in this message of family discipleship. Yes, and in Proverbs 22, 26 is the very well known to all of us. The verse that says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Does that guarantee that whatever we are doing to my children right now, whatever we are doing to Lucas and Sophia, their children are going to do? No, it does. Does, does it gu guarantee? No. But we still, as, as parents, is our role. And there is a, in um, child guidance, there is a paragraph where um, she says... Let me just find this. I lost for a sec. Okay. Yes. Where she says, train, not help, is different. It's not trying, like we mentioned yesterday. It's training. Training is something that comes by practicing. I tell all of the, the, the fam, the workman family, I'm sure you had to get your children when they were started violin. You have to practice. You are not going to be able to play beautiful like you hear daddy playing or like you hear other people playing if you don't practice every single day. And in the same way it is with, with this, training the children. So I just want to read for you a paragraph that is uh, in Child Guidance. It says, to parents is committed the great work of educating and training their children for the future immortal life. Many fathers and mothers seem to think that if they feed and clothe their little ones and educate them according to the standard of the world, again, the culture of the world, they have done their duty. They are too much occupied with business or pleasure to make the education of their children the study of their lives. I just want to pause on that real quick. That's still true today. Too occupied with business or pleasure. It's probably much easier to do this now even than it was when this was written. So business, right? There's we live in a consumer society. There's all you can always work harder. You can make more money. You can have more things. But is that really getting us where we want to go spiritually, right? Or also, um, it, it, like, what did she say? It was the it was the uh, oh yeah pleasure in um, business or pleasure. That's the other thing that I, that it's easy to get involved in in this consumer society, right? There's just so many things to do, so many activities that we can be involved in. And if we're following the culture of the world, um, it, it's so easy to get involved in things that may not even be bad in and of themselves. But if we're so busy and our schedules are so full of all these other things, it's good very things. good things. It can be good things. But good things can be the enemy of God things. Yes. Okay? And so we really need to make sure that we have that, that we're following a simple approach to our lifestyle and not letting overwork or just doing things that may be okay, but that they're really kind of undermining our efforts toward family discipleship. Yes, and at the end of the paragraph, she writes, in quotes, tell a child the way he should go, and when he is old, 
he will not depart from she it. She said Solomon did not Solomon say did yeah, not, that. yeah, that's what Solomon did not do. He didn't say tell a child the way he should go. But train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so going back to the principle of training, training, not trying, not telling. Or not just lecturing. Exactly. Yeah. So um, the results are not guaranteed for us as parents. But with much prayer and with teaching the kids with principles that we already have taught, we have the seed planted. And how many times have we seen, I, I'm sure many of you have seen this, I have seen with people that when they turn loose from home, when they turn 18, they just go to, their, go to college, do their thing. But later in life, when they have their own family, the words the parents taught are still there. The principles are still there. That's why we see now so many grandparents bringing their grandchildren to church. The children don't want to come, but they want their children to... Yeah, we have the grandparents. Their children don't want to come, but they want their children, the grandchildren, to learn what they learn. So the grandparents bring. And a lot of times, with time and a lot of prayer from the parents, the, the children end up coming back. Yeah, we've seen this, uh, obviously, uh, we're, we're, we pastor, we've been pastoring now for 13 years, and so you can see a lot of variations in that, and that's a fairly common thing that we see there is, is uh, you know, parents will have grand, grandparents bring, bring kids to church. We're thankful for that, yes. and we're certainly thankful that, that children are getting that exposure, but at the end of the day, it, it's on us as parents to really, uh, really sink these values deeply into um, our children, as we mentioned yesterday, that our, our children's minds are like sponges, okay? And sponges will get filled in this world. It, they, they don't stay just empty. Mm -hmm. They will get saturated with something. And so for us as parents, it's, it's such a wonderful opportunity for us to really work to teach our children the scriptures, teach them the ways of God. And that way their minds are being saturated with the word of God. And a foundational element, as we spoke about yesterday, personal worship and personal connection with God being really foundational to effective discipleship and parenting. I got to be connected with God in order to connect my children with him. Uh, we also must be connected with God as a family. This was somewhat of a new concept for me uh, growing up, not, not going to church. And then I became a disciple of Jesus. And then, and then I married Chris, and she was a, a disciple of Jesus as well. And we had children. And and it's easy for us to live these sort of atomized American lives where everybody does their own thing to some degree. And God wants us to actually function as a family unit, not just individual people that love God and are sort of loosely connected, but deeply connected. And one way that we have found that has been very instrumental in getting our family on the right track is having consistent daily family worship. Notice I put two words in front of that. I didn't just say family worship. I mentioned two things in front of it. Who was listening? What did I say? Consistent daily family worship. I think most of us have family worship. I'd be surprised if no one, if someone says, what is that? Family worship. Never heard of that, right? Now you may be here. Praise God. You're going to learn more about it if that's where you're at, okay? But most of us have, have some experience with family worship. But it's really important, we found, for this to be consistent and for it to be daily, not, not kind of a haphazard thing. Because remember, everything that we are doing is discipling. You're either discipling in the world's ways or you're discipling in God's ways or you're kind of blending it together in some ways. And so, and I'll just be honest on this. In times past, I would allow busyness. And, and, and when you're in ministry, you can be very busy. You can be so busy doing the, what, what's the cliche statement? You, you said something similar the other day, Tom. It's, uh, it's you can be so busy with the work of the Lord, you forget the Lord of the work. You know, you can just get so busy with so many things. And God just really convicted me of this a few years ago and said, Blake, you are making a big mistake if you get too busy with other things, even if it's ministry-related things, and you're neglecting really having consistent daily family worship with your family. Because what I would be, what I was really subtly teaching my kids is that it's okay to serve God in a haphazard way. Now, you, you guys have read your Bibles, right? What do you think about that? Do you think God is okay with us serving him in a haphazard way, yes or no? No, no. no. Now, God is merciful and gracious. He doesn't cast us away because of our, 
our, our, our flesh, our inability to, our, our, our lack of effort in putting forth what we should do right. I don't want to give that wrong impression, but God calls us to such a beautiful and higher standard, and he wants us to be fully committed to him. And for me, as the man of the household, it just really fell on me as the leader of the household. As I said, look, if this is not happening, it ultimately falls on me. If it's not happening consistently, and I just need to put this at the top of the list, doesn't matter what else happens. So we're going to talk a little bit about family worship. Now, I think it's good to have family worship morning and evening, like the morning and evening sacrifice in ancient Israel. They had a, a morning sacrifice. They had an evening sacrifice, okay? They also had other sacrifices throughout the day and so on. So we don't have to just have worship just morning and evening, but I think that is a good baseline to start from. Sometimes we're just driving in the car. We'll just have what we call popcorn prayer, where we'll just pray, and uh, I'll say a prayer, Chris will say a prayer, and the kids will say a prayer, and we'll just pray for whatever comes to mind. And we've really seen the Lord really just work in our family in doing that. We're praying for relatives, praying for friends, people we know that have needs, and we're able to kind of pray for more people than if we're just having, say, like one prayer and everybody says one little prayer. If we just pray for a while as a family, um, we are able to pray, you know, for a lot more people that way, number one. And number two, I think this really helps to teach our children more of really how to have a, a vital connection with God. It's not just a formal type of thing where we just say, because let's face it, we all have sort of standard prayers that, that we pray. Lord, thank you for this day you've given us, and please bless so-and-so. You know what I mean? We can kind of go through the routine some, and I guess that's normal. The human mind does work in patterns. But there needs to be time of just, I think, spontaneous, free-flowing prayer that we're including our children in as well, so they're really learning how to talk to God as a friend, not just in a formal setting maybe where we're kneeling around you know, our living room. Right there, as important as that as, that is as well. And uh, for me, uh, growing up, it was that's how basically it was. We it was very formal. You stop everything. You you say your formal prayers, and it's incredible to, for me to notice that. And I I said that, and I feel they're not gonna hear. If they listen to this, they're not gonna understand. So I can say this about my father. He today say the same prayers, the same format as he did when I was a child. And I'm we need to uh, mix, it up a bit. mix it up. Yes, it's not that he has it memorized. It's not like saying the Lord's prayer. It's a routine. It's a routine. Yes. So uh, as we started doing more um, uh, consistently with our children, we instituted our format, and I, we just want to share again. This is basics, like we talk about. But sometimes it's good to review the basics, and everybody. Uh, can adapt to their families, but what we do... Let me touch on that for a second, yes. because this is... Sorry, this He's is, a preacher. Yeah, I got <laughs> This is important, because they don't, no one ever taught me how to do this, how to have family worship. You know, it's one of these things I heard about. I mean, I have a master's degree from Andrews University and the seminary that I learned all this theology and Greek and Hebrew. No one ever said, here's some thoughts on how to do family worship. And so, and I didn't grow up having family worship, and so... Um, Chris would kind of talk about this to me some. We should have family worship. And so I, and I would say, yes, we should. What do you do for family worship? Okay, let's uh, And I don't want to put you on the spot, or... but I would do Go like... Go ahead, you can. It's when we first... Lucas was probably like two years old. We would do family worship. And Blake is a very intelligent person. He has a very big vocabulary. Sometimes he says words that I don't know. And he is using words to teach Lucas that were not child-friendly. So I'm like, how do you expect him to understand what you're saying? So um, that was another aspect that, you know, uh, we need to bring to their language, not necessarily make it simple, but the words. Age appropriate. Being, exactly. Yeah, what you're sharing. I, I was giving a little mini uh, MDiv degree. <laughs> to a two-year-old. To a two-year-old. And I've done that with children's stories at times. Yes. I, would use these, I would use these terms. My wife would say, Kids know those words. I, was, I talked about perplexities one time. And the kids, these kids, I'm making them perplexed. <laughs> and so, yes, we, we have to bring it, bring it down, you know, to, to their level. That's important. And also, uh, what you do then? It's not like he always uses this this uh, uh, term. It's not rocket science. It's simple. So basically, what we do? We sing some songs, and and our role we sing hymns because. Uh, many times we were in a context where at church they sang more uh, of the modern contemporary songs, modern yeah. songs than the, the hymns. And I have a uh, passion for hymns. I think
think they speak so deeply to our heart. And I don't want my kids to forget how to sing blessed assurance, how to sing near my Lord to thee. And in songs like that, uh, this is my father's world. So we sing hymns and uh, then we have, we have our opening prayer, of course, and sing. Then we did different things. We went to the book of Proverbs at a certain time with them. So we would read a, a verse, one of the verses every day, or a proverb, sometimes it's more than one verse. And then we study that, talk about that. And then we would pray and go on with our day. And sometimes, as the kids are growing old, they have questions that are really relevant and even surprising to us that they are thinking that way. So we tend to keep our, our time for family worship flexible. We're not in a hurry. It's not supposed to be when he has a meeting, like right after or something. So we try to keep, uh, we don't want to rush, but of course we don't want to drag to be too long. Yeah, let me, can I touch on that for a second? Sure. Too? I think it's important to unpack that just a little bit. Because um, I want to make this, because like I said, I know many of you have family worship and that we praise God for that. And um, maybe you learn a thing or two here, but I know there's got to be people here or watching online that are like me, where I was at a few years ago. I mean, I was a pastor of a church and didn't really know how to do this. And so I know, I, I know I'm not the only one out there that doesn't really understand the logistics of this. So I want to break this down. Like Chris is doing it very well at explaining it. But I just want to say this. Morning and evening worship, we tend to do, I, I think one of them is probably going to be the more significant worship, meaning that you're going to unpack things a little more, there's more time to talk and discuss. Another one it may be a little shorter, where you're just maybe reading a verse and praying. Now, if you can do two larger ones, that's good. We've kind of struggled with that. Um, our, our, our morning one tends to be the more significant one, where if the kids are asking questions, we just take time, we're not in a rush. You know, and we'll have, and we've seen God just really working where our kids are asking very good questions, and and we, we I can just see the Spirit of God working on my kids. You know, as they ask these questions, we'll explain them, and I can see the mind turning, and it's a beautiful thing to see. You know, that is for our morning time, so we don't drag it out, and make it you know long intentionally. Sometimes it's, it's short, but if if the Spirit is moving, we let it go a little longer. So I think there should be one where there's going to be some flexibility to how the Lord leads. It may go a little shorter, may go a little longer. Now, my work schedule is different. Being a minister, I work at nights, you know, a lot. And so mornings are better for us. But for most men, I think it's probably going to be evening may be a better time to do that. The morning one may just be more of a let's read a verse, uh, let's have a prayer. It's maybe a shorter one if you have a lot of activities in the morning. But I would just say have one of those times to be a little more open-ended. And that may mean you start a little bit earlier before bedtime. So you have some time to talk and discuss. And one advantage, especially when your kids are young, I don't know how it is when they get older, but kids don't seem to like going to bed. Have you notice that? They always want to kind of stay up a little more. And so you can kind of almost, it's like, it's almost incentivizing them to ask some good questions and keep things going a little bit because they don't kind of try to stay up a little later for bedtime. And so we have to discern, is this really a sincere inquiry or is this more, no, what about this? <laughs> okay, Sometimes it's time to wrap it up and let's go to subject. bed. Anything so, to do with the subject. And so when we first started out having, you know, family worship, we also found that it was easy for tension to come into family worship because of our kids were, were young and they were being kind of wild. They were just kind of, you know, interrupting or bouncing around. And so, and we would say, stop doing that. Sit down. I'm family worship. Her, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, this is not, I want this to be pleasant. This needs to be a very pleasant and happy time. But yet I was noticing both me and Chris getting kind of frustrated and it not always being as pleasant and as happy as we wanted to. And so now some of you may say, you didn't know this before, Blake? No, I didn't. This, some things for me, it just, uh, and God's got to kind of knock me in the head on some things. And I just thought about this and I came up with this concept of like front end discipline as opposed to, it sounds bad to say rear end discipline, we think that, but I mean like on the back side of things is when they're already done something wrong, you're telling them you shouldn't have done that and so on. I would notice, okay, what's the, what's the, what's the things that are happening in family worship that are kind of causing the tensions? And I made a list of rules. I wrote them down. And then when we started family worship, we would go over those rules. And then we, we would have the kids memorize this. And, and we still do about once a week, we'll still go over the rules again because kids leak, right? You can teach them, but the, the, the lessons tend to leak out. They have to be continually reinforced. And so we're going to share these rules with you. And you, you can probably get an idea of, as we go through these rules, what our worship was like and what was happening before we implemented them. 
this applies across the board, not just with family worship. You can do this with any kind of behavioral issues that you're seeing with your kids. Just think about it. Okay, what's happening here? And let me be positive on the front end of things and just kind of share with them, look, here's what we're expecting of you in this situation and make sure they're clear on that. And brothers and sisters, God's working in our kids' hearts. Our kids genuinely do want to obey and, and they, 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 they want to be good kids. But just like us, they can get distracted and not thinking and so on. So it's helping just to kind of reinforce what's expected. And if we have more front end discipline, we have less on the backside discipline. I know that sounds bad. I, mean, I didn't mean it to sound. Actually, literally both, right? Yes. Well, so we came with eight rules, and uh, they are pretty self-explanatory. You understand why we put them there. But the first one was come immediately when you're called for worship. We do usually after we eat breakfast. Um, sometimes, depending on how his routine is, we need to do before. So we, he can eat faster and leave. But most of the time is after. And uh, so come immediately. When daddy calls or mommy calls, come for worship. And sometimes that even works for me because sometimes he calls, I'm in the middle of something and I gotta drop and I'm very task oriented. I wanna finish something before going to the next one. But even for me, I need to drop what I'm doing and come because we're getting ready for worship. Then the second one, no objects in your hands. It's very easy to get. Look at this toy. Oh, Dad's talking yes. about the Bible. And I even like books. my teddy bear. Yes. Oh, we don't, we don't need things in our hands. Well, Let's pay attention to what's yes. going on and not have distractions. And I try to think of a more positive way to write these rules, but we just left as is. So that's how they came out. So no objects in your hands. Have a good posture. You, we don't. And all this. Yeah. We're having a lot of this. And we're yes. Okay, let's, let's sit up and let's have good, good posture. You know. And that helps with the focus too, because all of you musicians out here, who had, mostly whoever had piano lessons, the teacher always said, you gotta sit with a certain posture. You cannot sit like this when you're playing the piano because the sound is not gonna come the same because your hands are gonna be lower. No, for everything you do, you have a good posture. So the same thing for the worship. You stay in the same seat. This was more particularly for one certain person. The little one. The little one. Bounce around. Now I'll sit here. Yes. Now I'll sit here. Now I'll sit here. Yes. Oh. Mommy's left and then daddy's left and all yes. of that. So we stay on the same seat. That you started. So you yes. can sit where you want, but where you start is, is where you'll be. Yes. And I'll be honest, we do give about one little grace period on that. So if you decide to sit in my lap and sit in mom, that's okay, but we're not going to be doing this a lot. It was a lot of movement, and so we just want to keep things focused. And so, See, I told you, when we go through these, you get an idea of what, what the issues were in family worship. Come on, kids. I'm saying, come. Go. Get that out of your hands. Stay in the same seat. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we just put these on the front end, and I'm telling you, it just made such a difference in our family worship. We just saw it was much more orderly. You know, we're, we're told that order is heaven's first law, right? And so when we have order... It really makes things flow so much better, and that includes the Holy Spirit. We're not distracted, we're not frustrated, and things are just flowing, and we see God's Spirit flowing in our family worship. And another one was, keep your comments serious and spiritual. This was mostly when we had those questions coming because they wanted to delay that time. So keep your sometimes questions that didn't have to do with what we were studying. No, we're going to keep or trying to be funny or bringing up some story, Bible story, but it doesn't have to do with that. So keep your comment focused on what we're talking about. Serious and spiritual. And do not interrupt. That's the basic of life for anything. So don't interrupt while somebody's talking, making a comment. You don't just interject without uh, waiting. Be reverent during prayer. That's basic. And have a good attitude. Because sometimes they were in the middle of something, you call for worship and you know, how the no. attitude, no. Have a good attitude. We're not here to have a casual uh, family meeting. We're here to honor God with our worship, to worship Him, and this is a time that we devote to Him. So we have to have a good attitude. So again, these were basic, simple things that... Uh, in our experience, we figured out we have to do. And he was the one who came up and we wrote down, and along with the kids too. And we made them repeat. Sometimes they repeat just to remind. And sometimes we have people with us doing worship, yes. and we go over, and they were like, "Oh, 
That's a good idea for my grandchildren or for my kids. Yeah, it's a great way to disciple other families. Yes. So when you have other families visiting, you can have worship, and then we always go over the rules and we have other families with us. So number one, we're all on the same page. And you're also discipling other families because they probably have some of these issues too, and they can see, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, this, this does make things go in a much more orderly fashion. And I just want to mention something uh, about also the whole worship. Sometimes it can be daunting for kids because we're mainly, uh, depending on the subject you're studying, is complicated or not. But what we do, we let one of them lead the worship. So different times, Lucas not will, always. Not but always. What we do. But yeah, basically what they do, they will pick whoever is going to do the initial prayer, what hymns they want to sing, how many, if it's going to be one or two or more. Um, and then when we were reading from the, we were we also read the, you know, when you go in the back of our hymn that are the responsive the scripture readings. readings there. Yeah. yeah. So they would read whoever is going to read the black or the the lighter version, uh, the lighter verses. If it was the boys and the girls, whoever sitting on the couch, whoever sitting on the chair. So and they would pick that. It made more interesting for them and also exercise their leadership. Right, we want to teach them to be able to lead out in, in spiritual matters, right? We want our kids being leaders and not followers, yes. especially as it relates to the spiritual things. And so we integrated that into worship and saw that really go, go quite well. And really, like I said, I come back to keeping it simple. Um, we, did, we honestly use the hymnal because the hymnal has everything you need. It's not that that's saying you, you got to use the hymnal per se, but... It's just, it's simple. And, and like you heard me say before, I like simple. Complex things tend to break down. I like simple and easy and, and just, it's, it's not hard to implement. And so we just will sing a hymn or two. And then we have some great scripture readings in the back of the, of the hymnal that cover a lot of different topics. And so we'll have the kids, like Chris said, kind of, you know, I'll either decide, she'll, one of us will lead worship, we'll put one person in charge and they'll decide, okay, like she said, boys read the black and the girls read the light print or whatever, and we'll read through it, and then we'll just discuss that passage and just let the Lord take it from there and have a discussion wherever that goes, and, and then close out with prayer. So, and just a so little nugget for me as a homeschool mom, Sophia is six. She was not reading yet when we started doing the hymnal last year, and uh, but she wanted to read alone and not have to share the hymnal. Why everybody is reading alone? So yeah. she And that's where she learned how to read from. She would, she would read words and we would help her, and now she can read. Like justification yes. and stuff, and she's learning to read from there. From there. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great tool for them to be reading um, during the, the worship. Right, so this has been a big part of, uh, we've, we've just seen how this has had such a positive impact on our family. As we've done this, remember those two words, consistently, daily doing this. Not just, oh yeah, we should have a worship, it's been a couple of days, let's sit around and do this, and what are we gonna read? And uh, that we, that's how I did it before, to be honest with you. But when I said, no, we got to do this consistently and daily, and we have a, a routine, we know what to expect, we know what the rules are, it has done such a positive, hasn't it? It's oh, been yes. so positive for, for our family in so, yeah. so many respects. And so this is about, you know, building up, right? We want to build up, but we also need, as we talk about family discipleship, we have to be careful that we're not allowing things to tear down what we're building up. So, for example, let's say um, you know where an athlete is training, like Paul says, and we, the, the text we mentioned yesterday, I believe it's First Timothy four seven, maybe I forget. You can look it up where it says, uh, "Train yourself for godliness" or "Exercise yourself for godliness," right? And he uses that illustration there of like a, a, an athlete who is training. So this is a part of building up ourselves spiritually, building up our family spiritually, and training. But we don't want to tear down. So imagine if an athlete is training real hard to go to the Olympics, maybe a marathon runner, and he's running, and he's got his routine, and he says, I think I'll go buy McDonald's and just get a milkshake when I'm done here and get a cheeseburger and so on. You see, you're kind of, you're building up and tearing down at the same time, and it's going to really limit the effectiveness of the training. And so we also, as we were getting much more serious about um, family discipleship, we had to look at it and say, what are things that we can see tear down what we are building up? And uh, obviously, we're not going to give this long, comprehensive list. I mean, you have minds that work. You can see things, too. But there were two things we saw that, 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 that needed some attention in our lives. Yeah, the first one is a big one. We already talked about you. Uh, Tom and Elaine touched on it. 
And anywhere that is said to talk about family, this comes to mind, and it is media. That's a big way, and it's, like, it's kind of a, a two, how do you call it, a sword. Uh, a double-edged sword. Double-edged sword, because I think media is a good tool. We are able to have people who are not coming here, they, they will be able to watch, if not now, in the future, because this has been recorded. So it's a great tool. Internet has been a, a good tool to be used in, in many, many circumstances. However, if it's not used with moderation, with a lot of care, and mostly for the little ones, it's very, it can be very damaging. So um, the, there's a verse in the Bible that says, I will set nothing evil before my eyes. And that's what is so available out there with the internet, with, the, with media and, and videos and movies and all that. So this is something that we decided that we really need to be very careful. I mentioned yesterday, we never had the TV at our home. We have the TV for videos. We, uh, we used to have the grocery store. We used to have store. none. And yes. I had this impulse buy where it's like literally, um, what do they call that? Black Friday or something? Yes. And I said, that's a deal. Look at that there. I, I think I'll get this. was a few years back, and we had never had a yes. television. And we weren't going to have cable or anything, but I thought, oh, maybe we could use it for Bible studies, different things. And we bought that and put it in there. I, I in retrospect, think it was a mistake. Because we, we weren't as in tune back then as we are now. Because not that there's, okay, there's two issues here. It's kind of Chris was touching on. There's the issue of, like, the content, what we're actually being exposed to. We were always very conscientious of that. Yes. We don't want to expose ourselves to things that were not good, but there's also just the time spent yes. doing this. And and it's actually I think this 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 undermines um, development of our children. If they're if they're if they're staring at screens, you know, then they're not gonna be as creative. They're not gonna entertain themselves. Yes. They're not gonna, you know, and so um, we we those are just obviously we can't get too deep into this because it's a it's it's one message and this is just one element. Yes. It's just something that we all need to be very aware of. And as you draw closer to Christ, uh, you know, I think he gives us wisdom and insight in how we can navigate this, right? Yes, and I heard there was this pastor in Brazil years ago. He is very musically talented. He's a pastor and also a musician. He writes, he's, he made uh, songs from, from almost the whole book of songs. He turned into words, which in Portuguese, you don't find many of that, those things. And he was talking about exactly that, the fact that when he was a child, his parents uh, encouraged him to be more a producer and not a consumer, to produce something right. instead of just absorbing whatever somebody else had created, had created. And that's what we tell our kids. God gave you brains to use for his honor in however areas your, your areas of talent. And my kids are very creative and we, we have, this is something that we have been very careful with because Lucas likes Legos, that's his toy. The only thing he likes is to play. He doesn't have any other toy in his room and he likes Legos. But what he does, he doesn't build the sets. We don't buy sets for him. He likes to make Bible stories and I like that and I encourage him. I built a desk for him this, this uh, quarantine. Because he didn't have a desk in his room. I got to stop you here. I'm so sorry. I know I do this so often. We don't often. have time for that. I know we don't have time for that. I just have to brag on my wife. When she says she built a desk for him, that means she built a desk for him. My wife went and got lumber. Yeah. And actually, I bought the lumber for another project and never used it. So she just used what we had. Okay? And she literally built this incredible desk with her hands. Like her and her friends designed plans and she built this. I just wanted to brag on you because that was really impressive. I couldn't build her desk. Thank you. She literally built this big desk for Lucas to, to build his Lego sets and so on. Well, thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, I do and like it. working with my hands and, and I want my kids to be that way too. You know, I cannot sit around seeing things to be done. That's why I asked Betty. Uh, what can I help you, or, or Kayla, can I help you with, let me take my, you know, I want to help, I want to do things. And I want them to learn how to use their gifts. And I thought, Lucas doesn't have a desk. If I'm going to buy a desk, it's going to be expensive, and it's going to be one of those that the first time you move, the thing breaks. <laughs> so we had this big 10 by, it was a, it was it was a big a, lumber. It was 10 foot long, and those like an inch and a half uh, 
Uh, Heavy duty. This, will, this, will, this desk will stand a Florida hurricane. Yes. He will, take, he will go through college and everything in this thing. But it's a six foot long desk for him to spread his legs around. He can build the, the uh, Pharaoh's uh, yeah, he has the palace here. Yeah. He has all the, Because I want to encourage him to do that, what he does. He takes the pictures with, uh, and then he makes his little stop motion movies. And even that, he has a limited time. And that's another thing we're careful with the media. We don't want to take too much time because this is so obvious. And we have people like uh, uh, Scott Ritzema, who has a whole, you probably have heard him, he has a whole talk, a whole series of videos on this. Uh, but we, this is something that we want to be very careful with our kids, to be careful the time that they spend, even creating. Uh, there are some things that we allow them, Blake will talk more about that, but we want them to use media the littlest as possible for normal. things that they are creating and not necessarily absorbing and just getting from other people. We want the sponge to be filled with something that will help them to create and not just to sit there. Yeah, so that's just, just something I think all of us as parents have to be cognizant of is um, we, you do not want the screen babysitter. That's yes. just not, it, it's convenient sometimes to say, watch this and I'll go do something else. But really, um, we just need to structure our lives in such a way that and our kids' attention span, so that they're they're satisfied. That, this is all tr also true for us as adults as well. What we train ourselves toward is what we will like. And so, if 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 we are just so uh, uh, you know into what's happening in the news today and, and what's happening on social media, I'm telling you, you guys know this. The, Satan is just setting the world aflame with anger today. And so there will be. From here on until Jesus comes, there will be more stories, more videos, more negativity, and it will just continue to fan the flames of anger and division in this society. It's just going to keep happening. It's not going to stop. Don't think that we're going to finally find some place of harmony. It's not going to happen because Satan's behind it. He, think about this. People know about what is happening in California if the media thinks we should know about it. So the media can highlight some story. Uh, that's of, of like two people getting into an argument in Central Park. There was one on that one recently. And now that is not only national media, that is international media. People are uh, uh, seeing this around the world, but they don't even know who their neighbors are, right? And so we sometimes get disturbed at what's happening in the world and say, wow, this is really bad what's happening in the world. And, and Chris was sharing some about this, you know, kind of distressed about the world we're raising our kids in. And I could tell she was a bit distressed. And I said, well, honey, at... On Lodestar Street, everything's fine. So we just have to remember what's happening here because this is what's really relevant. And I think this world would be a better place if we focused more on the here as opposed to what all is happening out there because all of this comes through a media filter. Yes. The news is all selectively filtered. That means to a significant extent it is propaganda. Okay. It is not giving us an accurate view of reality. It is giving us a picture of what people want us to think is reality. And many people, including many Christians, are buying into this. And I can see this angry spirit of the world coming up in many Christians. Brothers and sisters, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We need to turn away from these things and disciple our children to turn away from these things uh, as well. I think we should get into this one. Let, let, let's touch on these kind of briefly because I want us to finish the... the yes. mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> he talks, talks, and then let's finish. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. I can talk too. So, uh, another, so we, we've been talking about the things that build us, can build up and at the same time be careful with what can bring it down, tear, it, tear down whatever we are trying to build up. And another thing that we thought was very important and mostly for us as in the ministry because we don't have control of who we are associating with, which is the association associations of our kids with people, with, with contexts, different places and languages and all that. So language not meaning not Portuguese and English, speak, but yeah, you know, how people talk. Yeah. So and there's another verse in the Bible that says that company will corrupt good character. Mm. Right. So we, we very intentionally try to choose the friends our kids have by choosing the friends we have. Mm -hmm. We are hanging out, hanging out with, we, we hang around people who have similar mindset than we do, 
So if they have children, we know that someone is not 100% safe. There's similar safe. values. Similar you know, values, values, yes. Is that yes. right? Yeah, yeah. And, and with that, too, because we're going to also talk a little bit about mission work as well, and, and we'll get into that in a second. So this isn't always 100%. Right? I mean, we, I don't think we should just isolate ourselves um, because, and only, only be around people that are just like us because we need to be salt and light in the world, okay? If, if there's a light on in the woods but there's no people out in the woods, the light is kind of useless, right? The light needs to shine where people are. So we need to be where people are as well. But especially as children are younger, we just need to be aware of associations and what's going on there because... We found it, it can be just little things too, not, not even just big, I mean, it can be bad things sometimes as well. I'm telling you, the, the explosion of these screens everywhere and how common it is, unfortunately, for parents to just hand a device like this to children. And I have seen many times, more times than I could possibly count, children just on YouTube and just scrolling the internet without any filters, any restrictions, going wherever they want. This is a potential for a, a, a moral disaster. Okay, to happen because Satan will be right there guiding that young mind into things that will be very damaging. And so um, if, if, if for this reason alone, um, but it's not the only reason, we just have to be aware of where our children are, who they're associating with, and what they're watching. And so if we see like a church and kids on a screen and our kids come over there, no, we go over there and pull that back because I don't, my kids will see nothing on something like this that I am not 100% aware of and in control of. And even then, it's very, very limited because I don't want them, even if it's a good thing. It can be something, like we were watching some videos on, uh, on Adventist history, you know, our church's history there, and, and William Miller and so on, some short videos. And my son's really fascinated with history. So that's a positive thing for them to see. So I'm not saying it's all bad by any means. But even then, it can be overdone. What is good? And so, oh, I want to watch some more. No, go, go play outside and do something like a normal kid, like kids used to do. Not a, you know what I mean? Like kids did for like all of human history until yes. the last 20 years. And one principle so. that we teach them uh, any movie that you see, it's not going to be faithful to what is written. If you read a book, like a Bible a movie Bible, or Bible something Bible. like that, yes. yeah, this is what's true, not, yes. not somebody's rendition of. Because why? They want to sell, and what they want to sell things, they want to make it more romantic or more uh, interesting yeah. and entertaining. And sometimes the truth is not all, it's more like this is the truth and it cuts you. So uh, we try to teach that to them. So we, we talked about these two ways that we can tear it down, which is the associations and the media. But then let's talk back again how we can prepare them. And we are going to touch this very quick. We don't have a lot of time. But um, a couple of things, there are three points that are very quick we're going to talk about. Is spiritual preparation, intellectual preparation, and missional preparation. So the spiritual preparation, we touched about it yesterday, is teaching our kids and emphasizing the power of having a relationship with Christ on a personal. So it's them, I'm sorry, uh, it's them uh, learning how to develop that through their personal worship. And, uh, and no more than just a list of doctrines, a list of do's and don'ts. No, understand why we do the things we do the way we do. Yeah, just, just an authentic connection with Christ, which may be the most challenging. It's easy to teach certain things and so on. But um, really, we want our children to, I pray for this at times, because I, I think of in my own life, and you can think back in your life, and I can think about times, you probably can as well, where God really stepped in your life. You have those times, it's not every day. It's not every day that we're just you know, on cloud nine, spiritually, so to speak. But there are times in life where you just look back and you think, God really revealed himself to me at that time of my life. I pray for these moments to come in my children's lives. I pray for them to have places and experiences and people that, that they will connect with and that God will really work in their lives and they will be touched by him. Because ultimately, that's where conversion really happens, is when God really touches our hearts. And so I just think we need to pray for that and try to facilitate that as much as we can in the home for that, that spiritual connection for our kids to have. And then another, as Chris mentioned, is intellectual preparation. What do we mean by that? I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief and basic on this. Our children need to know the biblical, scriptural foundations of our faith, okay? 
not in a sense of where they're convinced of it. So I can get up and preach, and uh, um, how many of you are familiar with the three angels' messages, okay? We're, we've heard of that. Now, if I were to say, I don't put you on the spot, but what chapter in the Bible is that? I've asked people that a lot, and they'll go, um, it's in Revelation somewhere, isn't it? Or Daniel, or, you know? The thing is, we need to have an understanding of this message, brothers and sisters. It's a real uh, uh, understanding. We know where it's at because we've studied it in the scriptures. We know the biblical basis for our faith. And I've read that, and I agree with the statement, that we know something to the ability that we are able to explain it to someone else, okay? Amen. So someone can explain something to me, all right? Let's say my wife is a pianist, and she can say, hey, uh, here's how you play the piano and give me these concepts. That doesn't mean I can play the piano. It just means I understand it. Or someone could talk me into something, right? Maybe someone here is an electrician. He could say, Blake, I want to explain to you how the lights get turned on and how the power comes from, you know, and they can explain it to me. But unless I can explain that to you, I really didn't get it. You see what I mean? I just was convinced, oh, I th uh, this guy told me it works this way. I believe it, right? And someone says, well, can you explain it to me? No, go ask him, right? I may be convinced of it, but I don't really understand it unless I can explain it to someone else, okay? So brothers and sisters, our kids need to understand that they need, we need to study the Bible and to really have a good intellectual knowledge of, of, uh, of the scriptures. And one of the best ways to do this is to share it with others, right? God gives so that we can give. I always like to say that God does not want to pour his blessings to us, but through us, okay? When God called Abraham, he said, I will bless you and I will make you a blessing. And so the final point of this spiritual building up that we want to talk about is uh, this missional preparedness. So uh, sharing our faith with others and also serving other people. And my wife has a real heart for this. She has a, she's like her mother. Both of them have a real servant. Sometimes I have to rein her in sometimes. Say, honey, we just can't do that for everybody, honey. But uh, I'm glad she's this way because it disciples our children to be giving, right? That's how we learn how to not be self-focused is by doing things for others. And that requires sacrifice a lot of times. It might be sacrifices of things, of time, which time can be very tricky because we want to disciple our kids and, and have our time devoted to them. But also I really do. I think it's important to teach our kids that we need to take some time to serve others. Not everybody has mommy and daddy like you have at home, or not everybody has the things you have or has food in their table like that. So um, uh, my mother was like that, and I remember one of my earliest memories is going on a Saturday afternoon. My mom is very much of a Dorcas type of person, you know, Dorcas from the Bible. She gathers stuff from people who have things to donate. She would gather to help somebody who needs. So there was this family. They had a little house. It was a housing in still, still yeah. It's above the ground and all. And in Brazil, it's not very common to see that. And I remember, I still remember the floor. You could see the ground because it was just woods, planks put together. And there was nothing in that house. And my mother and some other church members on a Saturday afternoon, we went there. We helped to bring bed for the children and some food and fruit and all that. Uh, and I like doing that I, because it's important to do that, not because we're helping, but we're blessed. And sometimes you hear the stories of the people you were, you were helping and blessing, and it's a blessing to you. And I want my kids to develop that in their hearts too, that we don't need to think that the world is here to serve us. We need to go and serve others. And, and as Christians, we have such an important message, much more than things that we can share. Mm -hmm. And uh, the mission-minded... Um, uh, we need to not only have an re-emphasize to our kids and have a wisdom to balance in the time that we spend to that too. Right. Let's talk about having fun because then we're going to wrap up. We have, um, it's been uh, 56 minutes and 28 seconds and counting. So, you know, but I want to tell you everything I know about family discipleship. Sure. And I can, but you've probably got everything I know. Maybe not everything. I can unpack it some more. But like I said, this is the fountain. I don't like complex because complex breaks down. So I always try to think, how can, how does this really work? And how do we really make this simple and applicable? And this is basically, you know, what we found as family worship, um, that, that personal relationship with God, emphasizing personal worship with our kids, 
teach them the, 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 the scriptures, the doctrines of the Bible. I want my kids to know this book inside and out, okay? Memorizing the scriptures, mission and serving others. But this last one is pretty important too, and that is having fun. Our kids need to see as they grow up, I want my kids to think, I want to be a Christian when I'm older because it was, I had a wonderful childhood. I had a great time as a kid. We were always having fun and doing fun things. You know, I don't want my kids to think that fun is had in the world. That's not really fun. It may be fun for a little while, but there's a big price tag that comes with that kind of temporary fun. There's a lot of pain associated with it. With the kind of fun we can have as Christians, it's beautiful. There's no price tag associated with it. It's all free, bought for us at the cross by Christ. And he invites us to live this abundant life. Remember, Jesus said, John 10, 10, I have come that they may have life and have it how? More. More abundantly. Jesus wants us to have an abundant life. So I love what Tom and Elaine share of taking half an hour a day recreating with, with their children. We're, we probably should be a little more structured. We're not as structured with it, but about it, we spend a portion of our day every day with, uh, with our kids doing something. Um, that, that, that we enjoy, we have a good time doing, and uh, we just feel that really bonds us all together uh, very greatly. So, you know, I'm going to close with one last passage here. This is going to be in, in Genesis chapter 12. This is God's call to, to Abram. And he says here, Genesis 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, meaning your extended family. Sometimes people don't always understand, right, what we're doing. We have to be willing to step out of the culture, even if it's our wider extended family, our friends, and so on. We still got to step out and follow God by faith. So he said, get out from your country, your family, your father's house, to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation and bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. That sounds good, doesn't it? I want God to bless me, Chris, Lucas, and Sophia. God to bless all of you. And God wants us to be a blessing as well. Amen? Amen. So as we're seeking to disciple our children, let's also disciple other families, other people around us. And that, well, I think, will really help our children and us as well. It's not just them. It's all of us to just really be connected with Christ because wherever ministry is being done whenever people are being served and helped that's where jesus is amen let's take a few moments to reflect um, on uh, this topic i pray that god would give us ideas as we share and i also pray that god would give you ideas because sometimes i've been listening to messages before and that'll generate ideas in my mind the speaker didn't even say so i pray that's happened here with you that there's ways that you can see where you can help to just grow more and more uh, in this area of family discipleship. We'll reflect on that for a moment, and then we'll close out with prayer. as far as we're able to prepare. Thank you so much, Father, that Jesus came and called 12 disciples. That was his spiritual family. And then they have discipled others who have discipled others who have discipled others. And here we are today, Father, a part of this great web of the family of God. And Father, thank you for the families that each one of us here are a part of, that we have, Father. We pray, Lord, that you would help each one of us, Father, in our goals and aims to disciple 
uh, each other within the family unit, that we would all be together when you come, Father, and that we would help others to be ready for this great and wonderful day that will soon come upon us. Help us in this uh, effort, we pray, and we give you thanks and give you all the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.